Hello, and welcome to another episode of Dr. Mercola's Cellular Wisdom, the podcast where we examine what makes our bodies tick at their tiniest levels. I'm Ethan Foster, the quietly observing fellow who occasionally looks at the modern world like it's a zoo exhibit, except the monkeys have smartphones and credit cards. And I'm Alara Sky, the one who wonders if those monkeys might actually be better at budgeting than the rest of us. Welcome to our show, folks. We've got a brand new tagline for you, where we explore the micro so you can thrive in the macro. Are you ready to talk about some health mysteries that might actually be more predictable than monkey finances? Delighted, Ilara. I hear we're diving into gut microbes, tiny creatures that apparently decide whether our clothes fit comfortably or we revert to the sweatpants life. Yes, indeed. We're discussing how these gut microbes hold secret sway over our body's fat storage and metabolism. Picture them as little interior decorators for your internal organs. They're rearranging furniture and deciding if you get a plush living room or a cramped studio apartment in your liver. Sounds like a bizarre real estate transaction. And to think we never even gave them a deposit. Let's start with the basics. I'm told specialized bile acids play a starring role. Most of us hear bile acids and want to run the other way. Right. Bile acids are usually considered the cleanup crew for fats, like the dish soap cutting grease on your favorite skillet. But scientists have found these special forms that either rev up or tone down how much fat you store. Sort of like the difference between a personal trainer who cheers you on to build muscle and that friend who suggests you skip the gym to eat donuts at midnight. So if you've got too many of the donut enabling types in your gut, that means you might be storing more fat? Precisely. A poor mix of gut microbes is like hiring the worst personal assistant who not only messes up your schedule, but also empties your wallet on candy bars. It's a two for one sabotage. It hinders weight loss and messes with your blood sugar too. Then there are these beneficial bacteria that act like your responsible accountant? Yes, those are the ones that keep the receipts. They help restore metabolic balance and manage your weight in a healthy way. They even influence hormones such as GLP-1, which helps control appetite and blood sugar. So when your gut microbes are in good shape, they're like that neighbor who reminds you to take out the trash and not skip leg day. I need that neighbor. My trash is piling up. Now, the question is, how does this come about? We've got these specialized molecules, bile acid conjugates, produced when certain gut bacteria team up with enzymes in the body. It's basically a science fiction storyline, except the main characters are so small you can't see them without a microscope. Exactly. The relevant enzyme is called Vanin-1. It's like the ringmaster in a microscopic circus, attaching a small molecule to the bile acids, creating a brand new act that changes the show. These new molecules then affect a receptor called Farnesoid X receptor, FXR, like turning it from a traffic light that says stop producing bile acids to one that's stuck on green. So more bile acids keep rolling out. I can't help but imagine a microscopic traffic light with a glitch. It's always set to go. Meanwhile, the cars on the road, our gut bacteria, are just racing through. Isn't that dangerous? It can be if it's not well regulated. But ironically, in some cases, having more of these bile acids means less fat buildup in the liver. So it's complicated. We should probably call the next soap opera, All My Bile Acids. I'd watch that. The spin-off could be General Microbe Hospital. Now, besides these comedic expansions, we also know that diet plays a huge role. Fiber helps feed good bacteria, but processed foods feed the ones that open the door to weight gain. Yes, that's the gist. If you're big on processed junk and you're slamming those seed oils, like canola and soybean, your beneficial gut tenants start calling the moving trucks because they feel unwelcome. Meanwhile, the troublemaker microbes move in, love the chaos, and next thing you know, your waistline expands. The troublemakers are basically partying in your gut. Then you wonder, why can't I lose weight? They've rearranged the locks, changed the Wi-Fi password, and hidden the healthy metabolism plan in a closet somewhere. Exactly. It's a microbial version of a frat party, but fear not, there are ways to restore order, and we'll talk about them. Before we jump into that, let's mention that many of these studies point out how microbial diversity seems to be a hallmark of metabolic health. The more variety you have, the better your chances of having stable body weight and normal blood sugar. So diversity is the spice of life, especially in your gut. If you have too few species, then it's like hosting a dinner party where only one friend shows up, complains about everything, and leaves you with a giant pile of dirty dishes. Yes, that's the perfect analogy. The friend who only wants to eat chips for dinner is not the one you want controlling your meal plan. Meanwhile, helpful microbes are more like your chef buddies who bring healthy ingredients and teach you how to cook them. So a big part of the puzzle is how we feed these microbes. If we want beneficial bacteria, it sounds like we need to avoid certain toxins, feed them the right fibers, and maybe incorporate some targeted supplements. That's it. We'll run through some practical strategies in a bit. But let's also note that the gut microbes basically talk to our genes. They send signals about whether to turn up the fat burning or dial it down, influencing hormones and the entire metabolic process. It's funny to think about this entire microscopic debate happening inside me. Should we burn more fat or store more? then all those microbes cast votes. If the majority says, store it, that's the outcome. And we have no idea it's happening. 
It's the ultimate invisible referendum. But once you learn how to influence the votes in your favor, you can shift the tides. We can push out the rowdy microbes that keep ordering pizza at 3 a.m. and welcome the disciplined ones that encourage a balanced meal. I'd like to take them all to City Hall to straighten out their differences. Speaking of City Hall, what about the earliest days of our gut microbe formation? I hear that if we were exposed to antibiotics too young, that can cause trouble down the line. It can. Those antibiotics back in infancy might have wiped out families of bacteria that help us manage weight. It's like losing an entire team of personal trainers right from the start. So you grow up with an unfair disadvantage, like me trying to keep a houseplant alive after I've neglected it for weeks. I'm sure your houseplants are grateful for any attention they can get. Now, these are all interesting facts, but let's move on to some steps folks can take from Dr. Mercola's suggestions. We have five strategies, right? Yes, five. Think of it like a gut-friendly to-do list. First up, remove seed oils and other mitochondrial poisons. This means ditching things like soybean, canola, safflower, and sunflower oils. They're basically the real-life version of that bad roommate we keep referencing. So if I see a bottle of canola oil, I should treat it like the old leftover fruitcake nobody wants. Time to say goodbye. Exactly. Embrace butter, ghee, or tallow instead. Mitochondria are the power plants of our cells, and these seed oils sabotage their performance. Got it. So that's step one. Second step, avoid endocrine disruptors and EMFs. That sounds like a 1980s band name. Endocrine disruptors and the EMFs. They'd probably have a single called hormones on the run. But yes, endocrine disruptors often come from plastics, among other sources. Store your food in glass containers if you can. EMFs can also put stress on our system. Think Wi-Fi routers, cell phones, all those signals. It's like living in a constant invisible lightning storm. So small measures, turn off Wi-Fi at night. Maybe use wired connections if possible. Reduce that electromagnetic soup. It's about reducing the daily assault on our cells. Right. Third step. Start with easily digestible carbohydrates if your gut health is compromised. This might mean sipping some dextrose water, trying small amounts of well-tolerated fruits or juices, or white rice before heavier starches. Basically, you're easing your gut back into the conversation so it doesn't panic. We don't want our gut turning into a rebellious teenager that slams the bedroom door because we gave it too many vegetables at once. Exactly. If you dump too much fiber too soon, you can provoke an endotoxin party, which nobody wants. Fourth step, introduce Ackermansia supplements wisely. Ackermansia mucinifera is the friendly microbe that can shore up your gut barrier. But you shouldn't add it if you're still chowing down on seed oils. That's like cleaning your kitchen while the sink is still overflowing. So fix the environment first, then bring in Ackermansia. Kind of like remodeling your house before inviting fancy guests over. All right, the fifth step. Slowly reintroduce fiber and starches once your gut is healthier. If you're an active person, you'll need more carbs overall, so you can expand what you eat. Just do it slowly. Give your microbes time to adapt. Otherwise, you'll get unpleasant digestive side effects. I can confirm that my gut does not appreciate it when I decide to go full throttle on raw broccoli out of the blue. It's almost as if a protest breaks out, complete with signs saying, we weren't ready for this. A well-organized demonstration, no doubt. So, summarizing those steps, remove seed oils, avoid endocrine disruptors and EMFs, start with easy carbs, add acromancia carefully, and then reintroduce fiber in a gradual way. We should probably highlight that the main goal here is to restore balance. If your gut microbes are out of whack, that imbalance can lead to weight gain, inflammation, and even bigger problems like type 2 diabetes. But with the right steps, you can steer back to metabolic sanity. Yes, the gut can be surprisingly resilient if we stop assaulting it with toxins and start feeding it in a gentle, supportive manner. It's almost like houseplants after all. Some water, the right sunlight, no harsh chemicals, and they bounce back, turning green and perky. Are you telling me your houseplants stand a chance after all? This is the best news I've heard all day. It's an ongoing process, Ethan. Let's not get our hopes up too high. But yes, these five steps might as well apply to horticulture too. Don't poison the plant. Shield it from direct scorching sun, gently water, and eventually give it fertilizer. Over time, you watch it thrive. That analogy works for me. In all seriousness, many of us focus just on cutting calories or amping up workouts. But if our gut microbes are stuck on store every calorie mode, we're basically swimming upstream, correct? Yes, upstream in a river that's about to flood us with frustration. The gut has its own agenda. If we don't address that, we're missing a piece of the puzzle. That's why Dr. Mercola's research points out how critical it is to consider the microbial environment when tackling stubborn weight issues. So the bottom line, we've got these specialized molecules, we've got an entire feedback loop involving the liver, the gut, and even a receptor that acts like a traffic light. The more we understand that interplay, the more we see that gut diversity is crucial. Right, and if anyone wonders, why did I plateau in my weight loss journey? Or why do I always feel sluggish? They might look no further than their resident microbes, sipping tea and deciding to store every bit of fat. Give them a reason not to. 
which means no seed oil cocktails, no onslaught of processed foods, and maybe a gentler approach to reintroducing fiber. Sounds easy enough, although I suspect it'll require a bit of discipline for folks who have never thought about these microfactors. Discipline, yes, but also knowledge. Once people understand how powerful these microbes are, it's a game changer. They realize that adjusting meal timing, maybe trying short fasts, or focusing on nutrient-dense whole foods can dramatically shape the gut environment. It's the silent orchestration behind the scenes. But once it's out of tune, the entire performance goes haywire. Time to get the gut conductor back in the pit, waving that baton in the right directions. I love that visual. The baton wave that says, cellos, we're cutting out the canola oil. Let's hope that resonates with everyone who's had enough of the chaos. So, that's essentially what we wanted to share today, the link between gut microbes and fat metabolism, plus a roadmap to get your gut in harmony. A special shout out to all those beneficial microbes. Thank you for not turning me into a permanent occupant of elastic waistbands. I salute your service. They probably salute you back by gently fermenting your fiber and giving you energy. It's a lovely relationship when it's healthy. So, folks, we hope you learned a little something about the microscopic drama unfolding inside us all. Yes, and next time you stare at a canola oil bottle, hopefully you'll see a neon sign that says, Abandon hope, all you who enter here. Maybe that's a bit dramatic. Better dramatic than ignorant. Let's keep the drama on stage, or in this case, in our comedic banter, not in our mitochondria. All right, everyone, thanks for joining us on Dr. Mercola's Cellular Wisdom. We hope you feel wiser and slightly more amused. We'll be back next time with more science, more humor, and hopefully fewer references to unruly microbes partying in our intestines. Until then, I'm Ethan Foster, your quietly perplexed commentator. And I'm Alara Skye, your quick-witted guide through this adventure called health. Remember, feed your good microbes well, and they'll repay you in ways you never imagined. Thanks for listening, and stay tuned for our next discussion here on Dr. Mercola's Cellular Wisdom.